Well, I'm uh, delighted to be joined today by an old friend of mine, uh, Professor Dennis Lamroux. Uh, so Dennis has three doctorates, one in dental science, one in theology, and one in evolutionary biology. Professor of uh, Science and Religion at St. Joseph's College at the University of Alberta, where he's taught since 1998. He's also the author of several books, including the one we'll be discussing today, Struggling with God and Origins, A Personal Journey. And I have it right here on my Kindle, uh, or sorry, A Personal Story. So it was a great book. I very much enjoyed it. And Dennis, I uh, just realized today, uh, as I was thinking about it, I've known you for 40% of my life for 20 years. <laughs> So that's pretty cool. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah, that's time crazy. flies. Okay, yeah, it so does fly. it does fly. So um it's great to have you with us. We're going to be doing a two segment interview or two part interview talking about this new book which I think is just a really important book. So um I just want to jump right in if that's okay. Uh, but I got a lot of questions. Absolutely. And I just want to thank you so much for taking the time number one for reading the book and then for doing this interview, I'm 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 really grateful. So thank oh, you. Absolutely, I'm grateful that you wrote it and and for the impact you've had, not only in generations or a generation of students at St. Joe's, but the, the many lives you've touched beyond there. Uh, so uh, I want to begin first of all that we're going to be hearing more about your story. Maybe you'll share pieces of it uh, as we go. But I also want to encourage people to get the book, which is going to be linked in the show notes below. Uh, but at one point you were at Regent College where you did, I yes. didn't realize this until I read the book, but you did two master's degrees there. I just did one. So uh, I feel like kind of a loser, but we both had the same prof. We had Not Laura really. Wilkinson. <laughs> you know, I appreciate it. You're very kind. Well, you had, you had this professor, Lauren Wilkinson, and he told you at one point that sharing stories is one of the most effective ways to communicate cherished beliefs and spiritual experiences. And I guess that's a nice setup for why did you write this a book as a memoir addressing these theological and scientific issues. Well, look, and I'm going to stay it straight up. Lauren Wilkinson is my intellectual hero. Um, the delicious thing about me, I went to Regent College in my training. I was I was a dentist, so I didn't have any training in the humanities whatsoever. And of course, Lauren is a literary scholar. So you'd think if there's two guys that would never get along, it'd be Lauren and Dennis. And but at least Dennis listened and. Uh, so Lorne reshaped my understanding of how to read ancient texts, in particular the Bible. And so when it comes to the issue of story, I had finished all my university, and it was in 1997, Lorne said, will you come to Regent and, and give a lecture on, on origins? I said, sure. And he says, but you have to tell your story. And of course, my first reaction is, no way, this is an academic environment. I'm going to give you boom, 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 academic arguments. And Lorne says, no, 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 you need to tell your story because it's through sharing our stories that people can really identify and resonate. And so what I did do, first I said, no, I'm not doing it. So I went and did it. And it was a class of about 60 students. And when the lecture was over, so I gave the origins lecture and then I tacked on my struggling trying to make sense of origins. And I'd say about 45 to 50 percent of those students came to the front of the lecture theater, surrounded me in the podium. And the only questions they had were on the personal story. I couldn't believe it. And Wilkinson was at the back of the, uh, the theater with a real smug look at his face as if to say, I straightened you out on your how to read the Bible. and I'm going to straighten you out on how to teach. And that had such an impact on me that the next time I gave that lecture, now it was back at the University of Alberta, you know, I'm thinking, well, I can share my personal story, which involves my coming to Christ. Can I do this in a public university? And I remember being in the lecture and, you know, this, Randall, we lecture and there's a conversation going on in our head sometime. And I'm going, do I or don't I? Do I or don't I? And then finally says, ah, to heck with it, I'm going to do it. And the response in a public university was absolutely amazing. And since that time, I've always put the personal stories in my papers, in this lecture that I've done many times, and people identify with those struggles. And I don't think it's such a bad thing to say we all struggle, and I struggled on it. So thank you, Lauren Wilkinson. Yes, I I, I resonate with that 100%. I mean, I have a literary background. I did an English degree. And yeah, stories resonate with people like nothing else. 
That's why Jesus told stories, I take it. But also when you share your own personal story, it makes it real for people. Uh, yes. And this book makes it real. I've read several of your books. Right. And think about your back and think about your background. I didn't have that literary background. In yeah. fact, I went to university for 20 years and I don't have one English course. So I had to learn that stuff on the side. And I wish I would have grasped it earlier, but you know, I was the typical science kid who says science is king and if you're doing an arts degree that's a waste of time you can tell a bit of a knucklehead in my early career and eventually start realizing and it, it was region college that made me realize the humanities are spectacular and it's amazing scholarship and i eventually understood and started developing that and you might be interested in the book i'm working on is genesis 1 to 11 and it's a literary analysis hmm. and um Without literature, you really can't work in these areas. All right. Well, let's uh, let's back up then in terms of your story back to the swinging 60s, I guess. Uh, so tell us a little bit about 70s. your story. I'm not that well, old. Well, well, yeah. So so by the early 70s, you're off to university. So um, uh, you were raised Catholic, as you said, growing up in the 60s. But then you go off to university, early 70s. Tell us about what that first year, and particularly the first semester at the University of Alberta, did to your Christian faith. Well, it's there that everything started unraveling. So I have to start off. I went to an excellent Roman Catholic boys' school from grade 7 to 12. It was an academic school. Uh, we started in grade 7 with four classes, and by the time we made it to grade 12, there's only one class left, and about a quarter of the guys in my class have doctoral degrees, so it's pretty high-end academic. Um, I, I, I can't say anything bad about it. It was a it was a it was a great education. I'll also say, going raised as a Catholic, there's something that really touched me deeply is the confessional, where we go to a priest and we we confess our sins. And I remember distinctly every time coming out of the confessional, this deep sense of feeling clean. And I will say that that's the spiritual reality of, of God forgiving me for my sins. And this is the thing that I, I've always been yearning for. Anyway, so off to university. It's a public university. Uh, it's actually the French faculty of the University of Alberta at that time called uh, Campus Saint-Jean. Um, and there's a thing that's distinctive of French Canadian Roman Catholicism. During the 1960s, French Canadians were throwing off the church. They call it the silent revolution, where at one time the church dominated healthcare and also dominated education. And of course, a lot of these uh, hospitals have, you know, like the gray nuns here in the city have those Roman Catholic roots. So I'm not aware of this. And so the secularization process is going on. First year university, you're a biology student. So you start off with a course in evolution, which is the unifying paradigm of all of biology. And of course, I'm trapped in this dichotomy like most people. It's either evolution on one side or creation and God on the other. And by Christmas time, that was it for church. I mean, I was hauled in by my parents saying, we understand you're not going to church. Why? And you know, I love my parents, but they didn't have the privilege of going to university. Dad was grade nine. Mom was high school. Um, I'm the first kid in the whole Lamaru clan to go to university. There's no one to talk to me. And of course, with this secularization going on within French Canadian Catholicism, which I mean, I'm just wanting to fit in. There really was no place for religion. And so it was at that point church was gone. Now, I didn't become an atheist. I mean, I still sort of had a nebulous God, but eventually, as the secularization process continued, I, you know, ended up uh, becoming an atheist by my, what, fifth year of university, which would have been my, when I was in dental school, between third and fourth year university. So the process really started on the evolution idea. And I, again, it's back to and this is the main theme I have in my science, religion, scholarship. It's this either or thinking that is entrenched both in the churches and also in, out there in the, in, in the public, whereby you either pick science or you pick religion. You can't pick both. And eventually, as time went on, I realized it's possible to be religious and also accept the theory of evolution. A quick follow up there. I think you, you had said that you had like a Catholic professor who 
taught evolution, isn't that correct? Um, but they never really helped you to integrate anything. You see a little bit more about that. Well, here, here's, here's, here, yeah, here's the thing. There, there was sort of like, we didn't use the term politically correct back then, but on the very first day of class, and by the way, she became a very good friend of mine. Um, she said, you know, we're going to be studying evolution, but this doesn't have to undermine your faith. And the guy sitting next to me kicked me under the, under the, you know, under the table type thing, just to say, yeah, this is, you know, this is a politically correct disclaimer. We're actually, you know, at a Catholic college, they got to say that. And that's all that was said. Now, in the two years of being there, I can honestly say, I don't think I met someone who was a really committed religious individual. Uh, it was just basically secularism being pounded at us. And again, it's back to, I just wanted to fit in. And look, I'm also gonna acknowledge my own sin in all this. Um, I was a bit of a wild child and by not having religion as, and, and, and the moral uh, uh, commands of God through scripture, this allowed me to live the life I wanted to as selfishly as I wanted to live. Okay, well, that's a segue to what I wanted to ask you then about uh, how did that impact uh, when, when you be became an atheist and adopted an atheistic perspective on reality, how did that change? I And actually, let me just say here, one of the, the fascinating things about your book is that you've been for decades keeping a detailed daily diary, uh, which yeah. kind of provides a foundation. And you've looked back in that in those journal entries from the 1970s and a lot of your uh, recollections. So looking back on that, and how were you processing the move from a Catholic Christian to an atheist view of the world? Well, you know, there was always a bit of a philosophical bent in me, you know, I, I mean, I had, and so that's why I started jotting things out in high school. And I'll also say it's thanks to that French college, I did a, a diary writing course, where it really took off. And so when it comes to my diary, it's not like I record something every day. It's I record stuff that's worth recording and noting. And so, yeah, I've kept a diary ever since the early 70s. And I've got over 3,000 uh, entries. And so this helped me go back as I'm writing the book and putting the, the pieces together on that to see the pattern along the way. And so um, it's it's through the diary that reminded me of a lot of stuff I'd actually forgotten. And I could see the, the pattern emerging. And one of the patterns was as I was throwing religion away and as I'm heading in an atheistic direction, what this did for me is allowed me license to live however I wanted to live. And that was very selfishly and I was treating people very badly, and in particular women. Now, to become an atheist, you don't have to behave badly as I did, but that's what atheism did to me. And as I went through that period, and I have this one entry in my diary where it's between my third and fourth year of dental school, where I basically say love is nothing but a protective response characteristic of animals. So love, that's just a bunch of fairy tale talk. Uh, we're nothing but animals in heat. And of course, with an attitude like that, you can imagine how a young man with no scruples like me, to my embarrassment, how I treat women. Now, with that all happening, I'll also say, and now this is an interpretation, thanks to my Christian faith, we talk about the law written on our heart. This is Paul in Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. Uh, the law written on my heart was telling me I was not behaving well. I'll also give credit to that wonderful Catholic education that I was raised. We knew what right and wrong was. We were taught that very clearly. My parents taught me what right and wrong were. But here is Dennis the sinner not listening and Dennis going his own way, living that notoriously selfish lifestyle. Now, with that being said, um, something along the way happened fabulously. It, uh, you know, I went to dental school and I met evangelical Christians for the first time in my life and they had a huge impact on my life. Um, they were some of the best students in my dental class. Um, and I, I, I couldn't verbalize it back then, but I respected them. And I wanted what they had, but I couldn't say, I, I didn't understand what it really was. I wanted what they had. I wanted God and I wanted holiness in my life. 
So I think that's one of the first steps that, you know, got me in the direction of thinking seriously about faith. Well, one important high point I'm just going to note as a as a car fanatic about this period is at least you had a Corvette. You had a 78 Corvette, which is pretty cool. <laughs> With T-tops. Well, yeah, the silver anniversary Corvette. Yeah, but th this is part of the persona of the lifestyle, you know? Yeah. Fast cars, fast women, lots of drugs, lots of alcohol, lots of sports. You know, it's it's living that self-consuming lifestyle. And, you know, there's there's another element that needs to be said in this in this story. And this is the first half of the book. It's the greatest the greatest hurt in my life was I did not get into medical school. I just missed it. I was in a on the uh, the waiting list and I got into dental school and I was bitter with regards to that. I had friends who. Uh, you know, my first year of university was almost a straight A plus average. Then my second year of university, I went to residence. And of course, I lived the residence lifestyle and my grades just fell out. And when I got into dental school, but not medicine, that was that was a, a millstone around my neck that I just that that for 10 years I, I battled with. And as I look back at that and I, I know what it was because I, I'd lost my foundation, which is God. And so the moment you get rid of God, something's going to replace it. And we've got a technical term for that in theology. It's not that technical. It's idolatry. So medicine became my idol. And because I couldn't get my idol, I had my idol in my fingers and it slipped through my fingers. Oh, was I bitter and twisted. And so for the four years of dental school, you know, wanting to be in medicine, I, I hated it all the way through. And and I never forgot it. So um, that's that's part of the story is I was looking for love in all the wrong places. I was looking for the love of God, but I was trying to find it in something else. And so as this process occurred, and the other part of the story is about halfway through the book, I eventually got into medicine. But at this point, I am now a Christian and I'm learning what idolatry is. And even in my diary entries, I'm actually verbalizing, do I really want to go to medicine? And the answer is no. The only reason you want to go to medicine is because you never got in back in 74. And medicine is to make you feel good. And that is the last reason why you go to medicine. Are you called to go there? So what happened is, so I come out of this phase of unbelief. I'm looking for God, and I always love saying it. It's by being, well, I was in the military. They paid my way through dental school, and one of my postings was the Nicosia Cyprus, and it was reading the Gospel of John. And I'm sure you know that. I mean, a lot of adult conversions by reading the Gospel of John. So it's by reading the Gospel of John that I became a Christian. And as I'm reading the scripture, and here's the one thing that just exploded in my mind, I couldn't stop reading. I became a reading machine. You know, I, you know, on a working day, I'd read four hours of scripture. On weekends, I read eight hours of scripture. And so we think of that wonderful passage of Paul in Romans 12, too, talks about the remodeling of your mind. So my mind was being remodeled under the categories of scripture. And the other thing is Hebrews uh, 4.12, where the word of God is a double-edged sword that rips apart our souls and our hearts the whole bit. And so during that process, it became very clear that what was going on in my life was the medicine thing that was an idol in my life. Now, let's make it very clear. Medicine is a wonderful, wonderful profession. Um, I've got a lot of wonderful friends who take good care of my health, but what was medicine to me? Medicine was an idol. And as I'm growing in my faith, there's a sense of God calling me to, you know, not go to medicine, but instead to go in the direction of theology. And in particular, and it's, of course, the origins thing, go in the direction of origins to ultimately become a creation scientist. That was the original plan. So that, and the dream was, it was a fantasy. I didn't think it was gonna act, actually happen, but two, two PhDs, one in theology, one in biology. And the whole goal was to finish that training and then to attack all these evolutionists along the way. I just wanna, <clears throat> excuse me, draw attention again to the cover, which depicts Jonah washed up on the beach. And there's some, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, wonderful thematic connections, both with, as you said, 
<clears throat> your struggle in terms of the idolatry of medicine, but also discerning yeah. God's will. And, you know, do you go to, as you'll talk about later on in the book, and as we'll talk about in the next or at the end of this interview, going to reach in college, right? And and what really is God's will for your life? So it's a, it's a great image, but I just want to back up for a minute. So you had the conversion when you're in Cyprus. Can you just say a little bit about that context, how that, what you were doing in Cyprus? It's quite a fascinating story in and of itself, and then how that conversion came about, and then how you come back to Canada now with a new vision of things. Well, the Cyprus tour was always one of the parties, biggest parties in the Canadian Armed Forces. I started applying to Cyprus when I was a dental student. Obviously, they're not going to send a dental student over there. But they knew I wanted to go to Cyprus because I'd heard of all the wild and crazy times. So that was the reason I went to Cyprus. And in fact, they sent me to Cyprus as early as they could. They wanted me to have at least one year of practicing dentistry under my belt. So in my second year, I'm off to Cyprus. Now, what is happening along the way? And it's it's the lifestyle that I'm realizing the vacuity and emptiness of it, the drinking, the women, the fast cars, the excessive sports. I'm, I'm just and I'm a bit of a cynic. I'm look at, looking at this thing. Is this all you're going to do for the rest of your life? And I am I use the expression I'm bottoming out on on this lifestyle and I'm I am searching and the question of the God questions coming up. Now, here's the interesting thing. So I finished dental school in the spring of 1978. Where am I in September 78? I'm back in school doing a philosophy course on the history of great philosophers. And it's there that I discovered just about all the greatest philosophers thought seriously about God. So that started the process again to consider God as a reality. I cannot remember when I actually opened a Bible, but it was during that summer of 78 and that first year out of school when I was still in, and when I was in the military at CFB Petawawa, I recorded my diary that I read the gospel of John a couple of times. And I have no idea how that happened other than I got a mother who's praying for me, uh, God's grace. And of course, if there's one book for someone who's searching it's the Gospel of John. That's what you should be reading, especially for those who are listening to this. You're searching, read the Gospel of John. So the process was starting before I went to Cyprus. And as I went to Cyprus and, you know, I, I, I you know, when it comes to the, the crazy times, I tried to limit repeating too many of those in the book because I don't want to glorify the stupidity and the sin. But I'll I'll say this one thing is when I crossed over to Cyprus, I was in Ottawa, I went out for a party, ran into some Newfoundlanders, and I have flashes of being carried out of that party, I have flashes of people putting my uniform on, I have flashes of being on a plane crossing the Atlantic, and I spent three days in Germany, it was the first three days ever spent in Europe, in bed, I was so toxic I couldn't get out of bed. It, if if there was ever describing a good drunk, that was it, because it scared me. I was 25 years of age, and for the first time in my life, I asked myself, do I have a problem with alcohol? And so that started the thinking. And so I ended up to Cyprus, and I continued reading the scriptures. I also saw the wild times going on, and I saw the emptiness of it. And so the conversion in Cyprus was alone in my room, reading my Bible. Um, there wasn't any dramatic things. In fact, I did it by myself. And the Lord was just working away in my heart. And little by little, I started seeing that this worldview made sense. And if I had to pick uh, a day, it would have been in the spring. Uh, and it was Good Friday. And, you know, we were 550 men went over in our regiment. There's only three of us plus two pastors at the Good Friday service. And I can't remember which crucifixion uh, uh, scene from the gospel is read, but obviously Good Friday was a crucifixion. And it hit me like a ton of bricks that Jesus died for our sins. And I started weeping and I continued to weep throughout the whole service. And it just it was there. That God loves us so much that God would die for us. And so if I had to pick a point, but, you know, it's building from there. Uh, it would be Good Friday in the spring of 1980 that um, I definitely, you know, became a born again Christian. 
So right around this time, you visit London, England, and you visit the Natural History Museum. And I lived in London for a couple of years. I loved the Natural History Museum. And as you note in the book- Spectacular. It is. It's You said in the book, it's like a cathedral. So this is what you write. Yep. You said, it was at the Natural History Museum, the bastion of the geological and evolutionary sciences, that I sensed the Lord calling me again to become a creation scientist. So now you've converted back to Christianity and you sense that you're going to become a creation scientist. And I'm wondering how you think back now, obviously that you've, pardon the pun, evolved from that position. Um, how do you look back on yeah. that calling that God placed upon your life on that in that moment? Well, here's the deal. And I think most Christians can identify with this, that God meets us wherever we happen to be in our life. And so where I was, so when I came back from Cyprus, I did not end up in a Catholic church. I ended up in an evangelical church and it was a great evangelical church. It was a fabulous evangelical church, but like all evangelical churches, especially in the 1980s, it's back to this thing called the dichotomy where there's only two choices. You're either an atheist evolutionist or you're a six day creationist. So it's A or B. Now, I was aware there were some guys called theistic evolutionists, but no one ever took them seriously. Um, I should add that part of my conversion story in Cyprus, and I took it out here, was running into Dwayne Gish's famous little book, Evolution, the Fossils Say No. And when I read that, I was on a holiday to Israel, and I just stumbled in a bookstore to find this. I'd actually heard uh, Gish debate at the University of Alberta, and he actually clobbered a paleontologist. And I heard this when I was still an atheist. It shook my foundations. And so to stumble upon this book, I think this was the ideal book because I had to deal with the evolution thing. That had to get off the table for me to come to Christ. And it did play that part for me. So coming back to Canada in an evangelical uh, church, still trapped in the dichotomy, being exposed to a lot of creation scientists, that got, those are guys who have some real good science degrees who believe the earth was 6,000 years old, the world was created in six literal days. And so I'm part of that tradition. So the episode you have, and this is sort of the next phase of my life, so I've come to Christ. And then it's the, what about God's will? Does God call us to do something? And there's the battle going on in my life going, you know something, I still got this issue with medicine. I know this is a problem. I'm starting to identify it as idolatry. But then at the same time, over on the other side, should I really be going to medical school? And, you know, we can get all sorts of people to go to medical school. How about going to creation science school to, to, to get equipped and then to go out and attack university professors who teach evolution? And, and so that was the battle in my life. And believe you me, it was a battle. And so eventually I got into medical school, at the University of Toronto in 1983. But back to my diary. In the, the, in the diary entries from January 1, 1983 to September 1983, when I entered medical school, 45% of my diary entries record serious psychological and spiritual turmoil. I was just battling over this. I'm realizing the medicine thing is an idol. I, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't have gone to medicine. Then the other side was, and it's back to this passage you're saying, when I was in England at the uh, at the Natural History Museum, thinking the most important thing I can be in my life is to be a creation scientist. All right, so let's answer your question. Where I was at that point in my life, God was calling me, but God was meeting me at the best place I could understand, which for me to be a Christian was to be a young earth creationist. Now, obviously in retrospect, God had some training to do in biblical interpretation, and God also had to give me some training in biology along the way. So eventually I went to medical school and the image of Jonah, and I, I identified this a long time ago. I went to medical school for three days and it's just like the Jonah story. For three days, he's in the belly of the whale. And in my book, I entitled it Three Days in the Belly of the Whale. So I was three days in medical school and eventually after three days, I, I put put up the flag and I said, Lord, I know I shouldn't be here. And believe you me, that wasn't an easy process. 
At the end of the third day of medical school, I went home to my condo. And by the way, I had all the toys. I was getting paid $50,000 a year by the government to go back to medical school. I had this amazing career in front of me. You know, the vet was in the basement, uh, all this stuff. And after that third day of medical school, I came home, I sat in my recliner, and all I did was cry and weep, realizing I'm making the biggest mistake of my life. I'm looking at my bookshelf with a couple hundred theology books, and then I'm looking at my medicine and dentistry stuff, which I hardly read, and I said, come on, get real. What do you really love? What I really love, what am I called to do is to do this theology thing, and around two or three in the morning, I made a move to the washroom, and I tried to throw up, but I couldn't because I'd hardly eaten. And it was with my head in the toilet bowl that I said to Lord, to the Lord, all right, I give up. I know I have to get out of here. And so the image on the cover of the book, if you put a toilet bowl in front of Jonah, that is me, even the same blonde hair, crawling up onto the beach. And I often say, well, I ended up crawling on the beach, a wreck beach in Vancouver, and eventually went to, uh, to Regent College. So it was a Jonah experience. I will say, I look back at that experience, and, and I should add one more story on this. And you know how important Cyprus is for me. So the very first day of, of medical school, the University of Toronto, uh, we're in this massive auditorium. You know, we're 252 students, uh, and the dean is there welcoming us congratulating us for getting into medical school. And there's a woman who walks down the row. Now, if she would have sat three seats away from me, that's no problem. But she actually comes and she parks herself right beside me. And I didn't know who she was. And that was just a little bit weird. And she looked at my briefcase and she says, are you in the, are you in the military? I go, yeah, I am. And then she said, I'm so grateful. My country is so grateful for the Canadian military. And of course, I'm thinking, oh no, please don't tell me where you're from. And I, I glint out the corner of my eye and she had olive colored skin. But I had to ask her, I says, where are you from? And she says, I'm from Cyprus. And of course, you know what Cyprus means to me? Cyprus is where I came to Christ. Cyprus is where peace came into my life but peace was now outside my life. I interpret this as Jesus waving his hands to remind me, do you remember what happened in Cyprus? And now, Dennis, you're running away from my calling. And that shook me up. What are the chances of a woman from Cyprus sitting right beside me? And of course, I've had a few friends saying, you know, was this possibly a psychotic break? And I, well, I, that's a possibility. And another person said, well, maybe this was an angel and not a real person in your class. And so immediately I phoned a friend in Toronto. I said, send me back the graduation picture of that year. And I identified her and that, that, that she is a real person. So when you have moments like that, and this is sort of part of the story, you start having these little coincidences where a little too coincidental where you go, this is, this is. There's, there's some design here. There's some divine design going on. And so it's, it's you know, that, and that was the buildup to finally with my head in the toilet going, okay, look, at, I've been biting the hand who's been feeding me for the longest time. And so I walked out of medical school. And here's the interesting thing. In the year after that, there's hardly any spiritual turmoil whatsoever. It's just a deep sense of, I know where God's calling me. And I knew the first step. The first step was to go to Regent College and work on Genesis 1 to 11. And that's the second part of the book is going through graduate school for 13 straight years. And so coming back to your original question, have I broken away from God's calling? No, I'd say what God did is he accommodated. And this is a very well-established notion in theology whereby God comes down to our level he uses our categories. He uses our ideas and our mindset to get across messages. So when God called me, the only understanding of a creationist was a young earth creationist. God was calling me not to go to medicine, but to get into this business called science and religion. I realized how important this was, especially to a lot of people like myself. I lost my faith over this. And so God also had some 
education for me in the future. After I made that move to step away from my wonderful military career and medical school and went off to Regent College. All right. So uh, fall of, of uh, 83, you had all this turmoil at University of Toronto. It's really well articulated on the page. I think people really enjoy reading through that. It's now fall of 84. And I just want to read, and we're going to conclude this part of the interview with this and then launch into the, the part two afterwards. So you write uh, in your journal, on registration day, 30th of August, 1984 at Regent College, I entered, entitled a diary entry in capital letters, the grand plan. There was only one objective, and then you quote yourself again, declare absolute and pure hell on the so-called theory of evolution. And we're gonna come back for part two, and we're gonna unpack what happened there. So Dennis, thank you very much for, for joining us. We'll be every continuing young, the conversation. Every young man needs a grand plan, and that was my grand plan. <laughs> All right. We'll be back for part two.